Hello there. Well, it's uh, just as Leandro said. I came over from Torino this morning in order to see Stuart Brand. And that was made me a happy man. Because Stuart Brand is the guru's gorilla. And I am quite the devotee. Uh, and it was worth leaving Torino, even though a share festival is going on. And it's an electronic art festival in Torino that I, I never miss. I'm one of the judges. And also, Artissima is happening in Torino right now. So my neighborhood in San Salvario, very lively right now. Kind of an around-the-clock party in my neighborhood. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I felt it was my duty to come here to Milano to talk a little bit about Stuart and his projects. Because I follow what he does very closely. And in fact, I have, a, I have a book by one of his disciples in my bag right now. This is the book, uh, What Technology Wants, by Kevin Kelly. And Kevin Kelly is a Stuart Brand disciple. And I am a Kevin Kelly disciple, because Kevin Kelly was one of the, one of the founders of Wired Magazine, and one of the founders, of course, of Wired Italia. By, uh, by inheritance. So it's rare, I mean, it's, to meet a guru is rather common, but to meet a guru whose disciples are gurus is, is difficult. I mean, that's truly a rare thing when, you know, the, when the student uh, matches the teacher. So I'm reading Kevin's book, and it's very interesting, and I would urge you to read it as well. He's a deep thinker about technology, very interesting guy. This is his first book in 11 years. I'm reading it. Even if you don't read it, I'm sure that the ideas of this book will end up affecting you, much as uh, Kevin's ideas in California cyber culture have, uh, have been affecting the world. Uh, so now I, I want to briefly take some of your time by talking about some of Stuart's ideas. And Stuart has hundreds of ideas, but some are larger than others. So I want to talk about two. First, the long now clock, and second, the nuclear power. All right, the long now clock, I know that it seems whimsical. Stuart is telling you about this clock he's designed, and how they plan to bury it in the desert, and how much elaborate engineering has gone into this clock, and how it's supposed to last 10,000 years, and so forth. And he talks about this in a very mild and quiet fashion. But the foundation that sponsored this clock has been working on this project for, it must be 25 years now. This is not some kind of hippie style, accidental, you know, interventional, artsy kind of project. This is a very long-term, deadly serious project, which was put together by a small conspiracy of extremely bright and talented people. And I kept thinking they would get bored with it. You know, because Brian Eno bores easily, and, you know, and, and obviously he does, and, 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 and Danny Hillis has had many jobs, and obviously he bores easily as well, and Stuart Brand is he's a polymath, and he's very, very interested in many different things, in architecture, design, and alternative culture, housing, and policy, and nuclear power, and environmentalism, and systems thinking. He's, he's really a, uh, a multi-talented California guru, so I thought he would get bored as well. I, I really thought Stuart would stop, that he would realize that this was just too large a thing to do, that it was never really going to work, that you can't just talk about moving stones, and to move stones takes a lot of effort and money, and it's, 
It's not easy, like pitching a tent at Burning Man. They're talking about using lasers to drill giant holes in the earth. You know, they're going to, I really think they're going to build the thing. I don't think they're going to stop. I really believe they're fanatically determined to get it done. I think it will survive their lifetime. I don't know where they will find successors to work on it, but I don't doubt that they can find some. I'm really starting to believe that this device will come into existence. Then what happens? I don't know. I mean, I can speculate about what happens. I told them. It must have been 12 or 13 years ago now. I was at an event with, where the long now cabal was there. The, the Bilderberg of the long now clock. <laughs> and I told them that if they built one of these clocks, someone else would try to build one that was bigger. <laughs> and I think that's very, very likely. And I can tell you who I think the people would be who would be upset at the idea of a 10,000-year-old clock built by genius Californian counterculture gurus. Number one would be the Mormon church. <laughs> if you're at all familiar with the Mormon church, they're a schismatic group in the United States. They were one of the first genuine American New Age cults. They were founded in the 1840s. And they are obsessed with genealogical records. Part of the theology of the Mormon church is that everyone from the beginning of time must be baptized into the Mormon church in order to achieve redemption of the afterlife. So they have tried to find the names and the birth dates and the marriage records of every human being on earth. They don't make a big scheme out of this, the Mormons, but if you research genealogy, you will quickly find out that the Mormons have the best genealogical records on Earth, and they have buried them in the desert in a gigantic blast-proof rock shelter in the mountains. So the Mormons, although they are not at all like Stuart Brand, might feel a little bit humiliated, upstaged, upset, and they might want to build their own clock. The second group would be the Scientologists. <laughs> They're another American cult. They were founded by a science fiction writer. They have an extremely lunatic theology, just a ridiculous Bible, which is all about tremendous spans of cosmic time and how we're all descended from aliens. And, you know, it's the kind of theology that would look silly in a B movie. And it's just, it's just, they're just a really crazy cult, but very, very American and very wealthy. And the people running that cult are basically grandchildren of some of the founders. They never, they were homeschooled. They don't have a conventional education. They are very wealthy, but they're very narrow-minded cultists. And they might conceivably want to build a giant clock that was bigger than the other guy's giant clock and probably more elaborate and crazy. And the third group, I know I'm stretching a little bit here, but bear with me. The third group would be the Piemontese. Because <laughs> they really like to drill big holes through mountains. <laughs> they, you, people don't realize this about the Piemontese, but they're always drilling holes in things. And there is, in fact, a Piedmontese cult. I'm not aware, you, you may not be aware of these people, but they were a Piedmontese religious cult. And they went out and they dug a private temple out of the rock, and they didn't tell anybody. And they like dug this temple from the 1970s, and it's like the size of the Duomo. I mean, it's just like a huge, handmade underground church. So a secret Italian conspiracy. 
of some kind. I mean, they're not a conspiracy, they're just a cult. I mean, but they a Piedmontese secret, secret cult. Some, some secret Italian group could look at this thing and get a little bit upset about it and think, you know, we're Italian and we have a much, much longer history than these Californians and why don't we have the clock? We're better designers than them. We can make a nicer clock, sleeker, it'll run better, whatever. Now I want to touch on the very touchy subject of nuclear power because this is something that Stuart said nothing about. Probably because he's aware that he's in Europe. But Stuart recently wrote a book which, was, is, a, which is an important book, which is about efforts to save our civilization from environmental decline. And one of the things he says in this book, among several controversial things. He talks about genetic modification. He thinks it's necessary. And he also talks quite a bit about nuclear power and how he thinks people have to build nuclear power plants if our civilization is going to survive. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I'm willing to argue against it. But I think it's important to read Stewart's arguments. And it's important to realize that we have to put away the, ad the nuclear attitudes of the 1960s and the 1980s. These are not the 1960s and the 1980s, and we really have a very different set of world threats now. Now in the 1960s, it was very modish to be upset about nuclear power for the very good reason that there was a nuclear arms race going on. And whenever you build a nuclear power plant, you were empowering the military of the Soviet Union or the United States to build devices, bombs, that are basically genocide in a can. And there is no, <laughs> there is no, there, there, there are few moral ways in the 1960s that you could that you could support a thing like that because there were so many of these nuclear weapons and they were being built so rapidly that it was obvious that a mania had broken out. I mean, a sane person could conceivably want to blow up the world once, but it really makes no sense to set fire to the world 10 times over. So there was a mad logic to the nuclear arms race that naturally made people rebel against nuclear power for moral reasons. And in the 1980s, there was a similar rebellion against nuclear power, which happened in Europe, and it was basically because of proliferation under Reagan. People in Europe were aware that they were being used as a pawn in the last days of the Cold War, they knew that they were the front lines of a massive power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. They did not want Pershing missiles all along the borderline of, of uh, East and West Germany. The Germans were not keen to see the East Germans set fire to. These were people who were <laughs> members of their own nation at one time and could conceivably be their friends again. It made no sense to risk a nuclear war in Europe. Europe was gaining nothing by this brandishing of weapons for the United States and the Soviet Union. If you were European, it made every kind of tactical sense to go out into the street and lie down in front of the trucks. Just lie down in front of the missile trains and don't let them move. You know, and people said at the time, that this attitude was idealistic and not very practical, but five years later, Germany had reunited, right? But the Cold War was over, and there was, in fact, no need for weapons on the ground, and now there are no 